Ladies and gentlemen, am I audible? Yes. It feels like a lecture. Am I audible? <laughs> <laughs> so I should ask if people online can also hear me. Okay. It's a really great honor to greet you all tonight. I'm not going to do the welcome. We've got a special person to do that for us. So mine is just to say thank you so much for gracing us with your presence and our online audience as well. I'm going to give right over to... Professor Zaleka Soji. She is the director of the School of Behavioral and Lifestyle Sciences. <clears throat> now, whilst Professor Soji is coming up, I'm just going to say that she's a daughter of the soil herself. Uh, Professor Soji is a social worker. Uh, she was the HOD in this department that tonight is hosting the event. For nine years, she was the HOD. <laughs> And um, we've been very blessed to have her as a leader, and we're very honored, Prof, that you can do this for us tonight to welcome. So thank you. Good evening, everyone. I, s I want to say to Viona that they took a risk by inviting somebody who's standing in front of, front of you with some form of a vertigo. So I have an excuse if I make a mistake, if I fall, if I make a mess of whatever I do, blame it on my dizziness. <laughs> I feel so dizzy. So, um, of course, what an honor it is for me to be standing here before you this afternoon or evening, having been invited to this prestigious event, a one of its kind for both our department as well as our faculty. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you who attended this event, both in person and to our online audience. I wish to acknowledge the university senior management who is sitting here, represented by the two DVCs. I've seen our DVC for research and uh, internationalization, Dr. Tandim Kwebi, 
Welcome, ma'am. And I was told that, oh, I see our other boss, <laughs> our DVC for engagement and transformation, uh, Professor Kiet, um, Andre Kiet, all our senior management in the university, our faculty management represented by our deputy dean, we call her DD, Professor Van Royen, our colleagues in respective departments within the institution, our practice partners, our family members, students, our colleagues, and friends in other universities as well. And of course, our very, very important guests of honors, our editors and authors who contributed to this book. I wish to welcome you to this event. Ladies and gentlemen, each time a book makes its presence or is produced, a people, a community, and a nation is given a voice. And I want to believe that this book gives us that critical voice that has been needed, that has been required. Without good literature, all we have to count on with regards to informing our own understanding and our view of the world is what mainstream media tells us. This book titled Critical Social Work Studies in South Africa came at the most opportune time where as a discipline, I'm sure not only in our faculty, not only in social work at the institution in at large and in other higher education institutions, we have to respond to questions about relevance. How relevant are we in what we do? We have to respond to questions about whether our curriculum is relevant in preparing graduates who are culturally, socially, and politically aware. Graduates who are able to respond to societal challenges. We have to respond to questions about ways in which we prepare graduates who are critically thinking with transformative acting, who are able to change the world by being in service of society. And I want to believe that this book promises to make that unique contribution in us being able to respond to this. We hope that you will enjoy this event and this service, this ceremony, and I want to say again congratulations to the authors and the editors. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Soji, for that heartfelt thanks. I'm just <coughs> checking that you make it to your seat safely. <laughs> Thank you. And we really appreciate that Amit's not feeling well, that you're taking the time. Thank you. Thank you. We now have a really special um, experience. I'm going to call uh, Susake <coughs> the Imbongi, that's going to do a very special <coughs> tribute for us. Um, so over to you, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Tuna Wonga. Uh, my name is Uchasa Chawen, I go as Babu Chiwa. I'm quite a poet. <laughs> So today I'm going to share uh, my most intimate works. Um, the first piece actually is inclined on talking about critical traumas. It in the Balsalani. I hope our closer speaking audience can translate for the English speaking audience. And uh, this poem is actually kind of integrated with English. I hope that you guys can get that little piece of thing. The Balsalani. Gazandos Gwenzangalali, Kangalele man go suke tini, Utangantoni kanga gam donumto, a gabu tingal and piloga ina atta, Utangazan zamez genam vozum, fond in a sala slap slap will a slammer long on a pezulo, a conting genayo zonga zia puma, Sukushan and genageniso, Sekatisile, Stibligas siam da go to spetek and gemelomokunga and was tingas of lega, good ten him and that solo conda betical tiang and toko, Conalendan dolom folk tenga kingaman and a yam desivan tenega 
Stating our Lisha, the Pachinos Lashakal on Aimali, who's of a Kalisim to Guzaku Telekusomba, who's in those men, Jelena Kosutuke, Congo Kosekuzakue, is in those Lunge, is in those Akumchola Zipote, Ubumyamabusuke, Matuba Namatams and Makutul and the Halilas Kasbal Sela, Gaza and those Gwenzungalali, the Abtembis and those Gwenza Vangel and Lungaku Kumbutas of a Taki, the Funas Chikalam of Akabo in Fundusokabanya, Mshaw Beneslum Kiso. I wrote this for you. Versifying revelations, the secrets of constructing a sensible operation of the mind. Because I have connections, I'm the postman delivering letters from heaven. The letters contain a basket of surviving material for a path. I wrote this for you, introducing your emotional armor. I carry words of wisdom at the palm of my hand. I carry messages from both the ground resistance and celestial city. And as young as I am, I can show life in three dimensions. So give me the puzzle. From the letters, we can find the missing piece and show me the knot. From the letters, we can learn how to disentangle it. I'm telling you, using the letters, we can decipher all the codes of life tetanam's turn you don't need pass on me some perform law tell me of the depression that whispers horrible music into your ears tell me of the anxiety attacks and the triggers tell me how much you've gotten to hate bad time must be salad sakan gets on those in business is a lie um to all your question to not go for your tongue song get long club as a suspect kuku to go as the bounces and those is pet a was a canon as cow as a sea born singer to be like a bottle of a new big pen and flabby a song a singer pity papa to abandon a big guy I wrote this for you, Goban Khalilas Kisban Salaan. Second please. Thank you. Um, this is more of a piece that speaks to us to share whatever we might be going through. Um, that could be critical traumas. That could be anything. Because sometimes you find that actually Someone else is going through the same thing you're going through. So talking to them about it makes it makes them kind of feel better because I think we are here to we're all in, in it together, right? So this second piece is um is about changing the game. And fortunately it is all written in Kosa, but I'm speaking. I'm hoping that the uh, Kosa speaking people can translate for the non speaking people. Um it is Ukuchinja Kwekasi. Ukchinja Kwekasi refers to changing the game, introducing new stuff. Um, collaborating with young and old people from around the world. This is how it goes. Daza le loa uku jala lom jala. Uku kuto la is pelo zo isa ingondo. Di kuk chincha kwe kasi. Uku chika kwe zindo. Di volum dia di ya uzi suku kanya kanya stoko toko ni sobu mnyama. Di nala mtsala ane. We are going to enjoy one very long time. The system of gangsters and crooks, the bukali, the things that pump the liquor, so that we are not going to be sane. We have such a warm day, and it's only me who knows how to stand up. And I'm so mad when we are fighting petals, but I'm so sick and got twin. The covers and gum, we are chewing. The little lamb, the vacant, the sun, the rain. The time I'm alone, the sun and the day. The umbrella, the cushion, the quick car, the little lion. Changani, the little chicka, the only can I bend to an end. I'm going to cook hell. I lose it, and I'm going to take it. Baya bona, dimi temba la badala, ikasa telinga kau ganga, tiza nendo encha lungi sani zija bacha na tiza upaga, tuku buya kwenye tai kaya, tuku buya kwa machi pa ukumbule kaya, tuku vuleka kwenye mando espanga, uku vuseleleka kwa manda mnyama, uku buya kwenye kolo eminyani, umoya nampefum la wamgo agdala, tikenga pambi lika kulo, tiza kukulozmi lonfafa zbi loku kete kuchinge. Ndiya chisa ndi ngu mlilo, uziva na wenezu zililo, ndi kukuchinja kwe kasi, ukuchika kwe zindo. Ndi vulumti ya di ya uzisuku kanya, kanya sitoko toko nyesabu mnyama, ndi nala mtsala ane. Uya ikondi njabu mvenu mungosi, ndi sustingo kenja nga mkusi, ndi mukali, ndi kwenga pambi ni kakulu, sa ukewe vanangu khasa cha wamduana, ndi kukubuya kwa mshaba, ukukaka na kwe ndanga, ndi lituba lisini nukuchileka kwe pepa ilicha, ndi kukusonju lulwa kwe zindo, emva kwa vuhu. Tonda ba dili pupa ilimioli elinga paza niswa na kuta gata. Thank you. That felt powerful. I'll get the 
translation later. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to invite Professor Annalene Kiet. <coughs> she's one of the editors of the book, and she's going to do the reflection for us on behalf of the three editors. Sorry, while she's coming, let me do my job properly. Professor Kiet is a lecturer in the Department of Social Development Professions, and I'm going to not say more than that, so welcome, mm -hmm. Professor Kiet. Thank you, Prof. Goliath, who's my HOD in the department. Um, colleagues, as you can see, I do have a piece of paper that is to ensure that I keep in time, which I really hope I'm going to do, and then having to put on my glasses so I can see properly. So first of all, I want to say good evening, colleagues, friends, family and students, especially in the corner that we have there and across at the back there. Thank you for supporting us here tonight. It is indeed an honor. Oh, I can't see without the glasses and I can't see you <laughs> I have on the glasses. I'll have to figure out the balance here. Okay. It is indeed an honor and a proud moment for us as editors, the authors and the Department of Social Development Professions at NMU to launch this book. You know, it all started with a question. And the question went like this, would you and your colleagues consider writing a book on social work for the series on higher education transformation? I will not say in this room who asked the question, I'll leave it like that. So I brought the idea to the colleagues and the journey then started. The editorial team was formed and the invitation made to the colleagues. It was intentional for us to build this book around a group of South African black academics who would critically engage um, the hegemonic status quo of social work, education, and practice. This was full teamwork, I have to say to you. It was participatory, and once a common ground was established amongst the full team, that's including all the authors as well, um, what the book should achieve. The authors were then given the freedom to write their chapters, around the areas that they wish to. So, they, so that was the freedom that everybody had. But I want to, to de uh, just take a detour from, from the process of the book a little bit. And once I want to speak about the need. So importantly, we now need to look at why it is needed for us in social work to interrogate the status quo. So why did we make this choice? The so social work history in South Africa has deeply, deeply contested roots. I'm always reminded by what Linda Harmsmith <coughs> alluded to, and I think she might be on the online platform, that we cannot develop a counter hege hegemony if we do not critically examine the history from which our knowledge systems developed. You know, if you teach an introductory social work class in South Africa, you stumble upon the uncomfortable reality or the scary reality that the very person responsible for the most oppressive legislation of the country and the formalization of apartheid was also arguably responsible for establishment, establishing social work as a formal profession. Hendrik Verwoerd, isn't that scary, eh? Isn't that shocking? And that some of the key structures of the original design as set up at the time, for instance, the methods of social work continue to be central to the social work we teach and we practice today. These seems to be permanent fixtures of our discipline, and I will come back to the danger of these permanent fixtures for us. So in effect, what it shows us is that social work run the risk of continuous entrapment in its colonial past. Ngugi Wationg reminds us, and this is a quote, that decolonialism involved the search for a liberating perspective within which we can see ourselves clearly in relation to ourselves and to others in the universe. We can no longer allow our knowledge about ourselves to be influenced by the West, as Ndlovo Katseni would say. Important here is what Eze says, and he, suggest, he suggested that the oppressive systems like colonialism results in societal groups having their histories and knowledge systems written out of the mainstream bodies of knowledge. 
So when people are presented to the world through the voices of others, the oppressors in particular here, the public picture about themselves is far removed from what they intimately know about themselves. And that's part of that deep alienization that we are having. Um, Shukani and Masoha in 2021 argue in their piece called Social Work as Protest that the historical entrapments in a, uh, uh, that the historical entrapments in a colonial past intentionally is silent about prominent black social work figures who played a significant role in confronting the oppressive political system. Examples like Alan Kuzwayo, Winnie Madikis, uh, 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 Madikizela Mandela, Charlotte McPeke, to name a few. And with this silence, we miss the opportunity to create, to create a truly critical and radical social work pathway. And one of our master students, who's also an author of this book and is here tonight and was the administrator of this book as well, Vuyos Masters, who's reaching an end now, speaks to this as well. So the question would then be, why do we stay trapped in this uncomfortable permanency? I use the lens of Alexandra Crampton, who uses, speaks here of a philosophy on, of impermanence, a Buddhist philosophy of things not being permanent and should not be permanent. And uh, bear with me here, because I want to tell a quick story in terms of this. She tells the story of the Zuni people who for centuries lived in the southwestern part of the US. Yes, this is interesting that we talk about, and I'm going to use an example outside of South Africa, and I'm just going to apologize for doing that, OK? Each year, but there's a reason why I'm using this. So this is how a story goes. Each year, members of the deer and bear clans, what is that? Another mic. Oh, OK. <laughs> I hope everybody could hear me up till now. Uh, members of the deer and bear clans carved twin war gods, which are deities of great power that also serve as protectors in times of war and peace. They are placed in the landscape to ensure balance and harmony. In the process of doing this work, um, they eventually decompose into the earth. They are communal property and they should never be removed. Come 1846, that was the year of the Smithsonian's, the National Museum and Institutions, they were tasked to help collect, name, and categorize indigenous cultures in the growing United States at the time. Over 10,000 such artifacts were taken from the Zuni alone with the idea that the value of culture should be captured, cataloged, cataloged and made permanent through scientific storage and display. Some of these artifacts were saturated with chemicals to ensure that they were preserved. And in this way, culture as a living practice became an object primary for scientific inquiry. This caused multiple harms for the Zuni people. So many art artifacts were taken that some artistic and cultural practices were simply absolutely lost. So the work of the museum to preserve in fact, he has served to erase. Crampton links this with social work, indicating that the work for the Smithsonian's institution um, failed, what they failed to understand was that removing these war gods from the original place and the sacred role, trying to ensure a form of permanency in the museum, completely alienated them. The preservation of this role required not only the return, but also the, 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 the ability to decompose and to become part of the landscape. Drawing from the Zuni story, Crampton then argues that effective social work intervention is responsive and relational, rather than self-containing and instrumental. In the Zuni example, it was not that an object was stuck in the ground, and then this object caused good outcomes. The Ayoda was successful not by remaining a permanent fixture, but through breaking down in local context. And this breakdown required active response for the larger environment. So a first lesson for social work here is that intervention success depends upon active engagement with those in the social environment. 
such that the intervention itself may over time change. A social work intervention that looked the same from the outside as within the local context is maybe not a natural fit for the environment. The second lesson here is that the intervention work must remain local in order to engage effectively. The act of removal itself not only prevents but also distorts any change or any chance, sorry, of being helpful. It is this quite unhelpful, taking best practice preserved through professionalism like South Africa, or like in social work, and then try and insert them into the local environment. So my colleagues, as they're sitting here, the other two uh, editors of this book and some of the authors in this book, their incubation project um, that they are driving, for me, is a fantastic example of intervention that is developed from the ground up, and it should be supported. The third lesson, and that's the final of her lessons, the value of impermanence as seen in allowing breakdown and disintegration. Impermanence in this case is not disappearance in the sense of loss. Social work may not disappear. Instead, the value of impermanence allow intervention work to breathe, to radically change in context, and to actively respond and engage the context it is concerned with. So I just want to, to, to finish off with a very, very brief reflection on chapters, because I know some of the authors are going to give a little bit more information about those chapters as well. But the chapters that's contained in this book through its interrogation of the hegemonic status quo can be seen as a challenge to the permanency of this practice that we find ourselves in. The first three chapters tackles issues around family, legislation and terminology that continue to have a strong Eurocentric flair and it results in the alienation of the people it is intended for despite presenting itself as collaborative and participatory. Chapter four and five bring the issue of land, landlessness and social work into the same room, so to speak. With a strong critique of the depolitization, uh, politicization, sorry, of the profession, still caught up in a paternalistic welfare policies, social work is actually paralyzed and it's unable to meaningfully contribute to the discourse of racially skewed land ownership. Chapter 6, 8, 9 and 10 pulls together the social worker as a person addressing what a practice environment should look like to support authentic development of the professional in chapter six. The, mis the misrecognition of the social work student as carrier of knowledge in the classroom in chapter eight, interrogating the academic self and how they shape the student's epistemology in, in chapter nine, and with 10 challenging the deficit oriented view held about students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds in the higher education space. Chapter seven discusses African spirituality, arguing that spiritual sensitive, so, uh, spiritually sensitive social work approaches, uh, arguing for that. And it reminds us also, the author reminds us of our own missed opportunities to build this into our social work curriculum. And chapter 12 resonates with the need for indigenization of social work education describing indigenous knowledges as rich, contextual, and people-centered. The authors argue that despite progress being made by local authors, much more needs to be done. Chapter 11 focuses on the positioning of women in society with the author making a strong argument for women economic empowerment. Um, she unpacks historical contributions of women in political and social spheres and she juxtaposed this against the ongoing challenges they experience today. The final two chapters, 13 and 14, engages issue, issues of historical trauma and how this is presented in many of the social issues our communities remain trapped in. In 13, the author interrogates the stereotyping of certain racial groups with a specific focus on substance abuse, and we know how big that is in our communities. In the final chapter of this collection, 
the author makes an argument for context-specific historical understanding of trauma and the large-scale cul uh, cultural disruptions that often carry cross-generational cult uh, collective experiences. I think I'm done. You're almost free from me now. Okay. So we really hope that through this collection here, as a social work fraternity, we can create a pause, a deep inward gaze, and an understanding for the need to disrupt and to allow a sense of impermanence to create a social work that is responsive to its local context and that can truly challenge the structural impediments that serve to sustain unequal societies. Thank you, everybody. Can I just check, is our online audience, are they able to engage with us? They are, okay, so they're hearing and they're on board. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I also just want to draw your attention to the cover of the book. We've received some very heartwarming responses to the cover of the book. And the cover of the book was a very deliberate um, effort for us to communicate uh, you know what was at the what is at the heart of the book as well and in on the inside of the page we just unpack that for you a little bit um, professor Soji spoke about knowledge being birthed from the ground up and professor Kiet spoke about that as well and and I'm just asserting for for those of you that are yet to get the book that the cover you know communicates this deeply meaningful assertion for us that all the authors are children of African soil, um, who are firmly rooted in the culture, the values and traditions of our forefathers, our ancestors and our communities of origin. Our land, along with all of our heritage, our knowledge and resources that have been left barren by the greed of the colonial and apartheid architects. However, they totally underestimated the depth and the breadth of our indigenous wisdom and our knowledge keepers, whose humble nurturance of relationships and all forms of life is allowing their seed to sprout. And we see each of these chapters really as a seed that's sprouting. So through the seminal text, we wish to reclaim, we wish to restore and co-develop a social work knowledge system from the ground up that will continue to provide nurturance for the next generations um, from whom growth will continue to sprout. So I just wanted to let you in as well uh, on into this very meaningful cover for us. I'm now going to invite our authors. We have um, Mrs. Zukiswa Guam is going to be the first author for us to speak. And Mrs. Guam is a lecturer in the department as well. And she is going to take us through her own journey. After Mrs. Guam, we will have Dr. Razia Nordin Lachadin, who is also a lecturer in our department. And then we have Dr. Tlali Anotani, who has really graced us by traveling all the way. She's from the University of Witwatersrand, so Wits. One of, so everyone is authors here, and we're grateful that you made the travels here. So I'm not going to get up to introduce the authors again. So they will come in that sequence, and then we will have Dr. Navashni Peramal as the final speaker on the author side. And Dr. Peramal is also then resembling the voices of some of the other authors that can't be with us physically, but that's online. Thank you. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will give um, a brief overview of uh, my book project journey by addressing um, four areas. The first one is the initial resistance. The second one, the reality. The third one is the process, the actual process. And um, the last one would be appreciation. Um, the call for the book project was simply not appealing to me at all. <laughs> I resisted being uh, part of um, the write-up 
of this completed book um, at first. Since I was um, already in the early phases of my PhD journey, and the book was only um, an add-on for me. I was concerned that I wouldn't be able to focus properly and that things might not go as planned. I was skeptical. Um, however, one of my colleagues, um, Dr. Perumal, encouraged me and suggested that I could connect it to my PhD so that it is not separated and has only one focus. I realized that um, opportunities like this are critical in, a, in a, enabling women to participate in a variety of contexts and discourses. So I decided to take the opportunity because I believe that through these spaces, the voices of women in um, society would be heard, um, black women in particular. And I also um, thought of the next generation of our daughters. The reality. I was initially stuck and unsure on what to do. I have seen finished um, texts with famous people's name on them, but I never imagined um, starting such a process myself. Uh, so I occasionally called Dr. Perumal for encouragement. <laughs> Um, as she would advise that I should gradually work on the book chapter. I can recall that um, she would um, call me uh, in the middle of the night and she would say, I'm sitting on my desk, how far are you? <laughs> um, she, she, she would um, suggest that we, um, I should take maybe write 350 words per day. And then um, she would ask, how far are you? And I would respond and say, I can't um, reach even 50 words, <laughs> let alone the 300. <laughs> um, but um, I learned from the exercise, the whole exercise now, that hiring is ineffective. So this whole process was a long back and forth process. And um, we are now presenting a completed assignment that was started with uncertainty. Now, the, the actual process. The, the, this whole process was um, properly organized, I must say. I want to express my gratitude to Mr. Vuyo Digo for handling the process with consistency and dedication. He has done a good job of managing the process. He communicated with us, the authors, endlessly and repeatedly. Um, there were occasions when I would really get annoyed when I see an email from Vuyo. <laughs> he, would, um, he would begin the email by saying, dear author. <laughs> so, but by then, um, by um, doing so, um, I got um, a lot of um, um, upliftment and I got inspired because I really wanted to be an author. Now, the last point, appreciation. I'm honored to have participated in this now completed process. Although it was not um, uh, an easy journey, but we have overcome many challenges given the busy schedule that we have as uh, academics. Um, I believe we all appreciate that the process is, is true now. <clears throat> and I speak on behalf of other authors that we feel um, relieved that the process is over. As you may know, um, giving birth to a child is a painful process, but when the baby is born, the pain vanishes and is replaced with feelings of love and thankfulness. The same is true for this book project. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to the editors um, and contributors for their support and the opportunity. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. 
I want to say, wow, fellow authors, can you believe that we are here, that we made it this far? What an achievement for everyone involved. First and foremost, I give thanks to the Almighty for this achievement, because without the mercy and the blessings of the Almighty, none of this would have been possible. So I want to start off with a verse, which is an Islamic Arabic verse, which says, oh, I need to put my specs on for this. <laughs> <laughs> My success comes only through Allah. In Him I trust and to Him I return. And you will understand why I feel that this is a blessing and a miracle for me especially. It's so amazing that my colleague Zuki and I I had similar thoughts in writing our speech because I also had four themes, although it's different, focuses on the same thing, the invitation, the process, the product, and what it means to me. So let me start off with the invitation. Initially, I declined the invite. So when I was approached to be an author, I thought about it. It was in 2019. And I declined and I said, no, I, I don't see myself doing this. I just finished my PhD. I'm busy writing an article. Uh, uh, I can't. This is too stressful. I, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm sorry. I declined. So Professor Annalyn Keat came to my office. I, I remember that so clearly, sitting there um, and having a conversation with me, convincing me otherwise. Um, I even told her about the article I was busy with, and she said, that sounds like something you can write as a chapter, but I felt I already committed to the journal, and I, I can't um, do that. So I want to thank you, Professor Keat, for that opportunity, because actually when we got the first message about the book being ready, um, I actually reflected on that and thought, wow. You know, um, and for me, sometimes we think we are not capable of doing something, but other people recognize our um, potential and they don't give up on us. And I think that's what the colleagues and the, the editors um, could see and, and pushed, you know, to do that. So then initially I was convinced and I agreed and I, I think it was 2019 when I got that acceptance letter that you now accepted as an author. Um, so, yes, thank you. It, it's really a great honor. Um, I have no regrets now that it's done and it's there, <laughs> looking back. But definitely the process was not an easy one. So, um, let me speak about the process. If I remember correctly, I checked my files on my computer and we started this process in 2019. I think it was towards the end of the year and we had our first uh, meeting with all of the authors and the editors. You know, trying to um, just have discussions on the way forward, what are the themes, what are we going to follow, etc. And then 2020 and 2021 is when the bulk of the work took place. Um, that was extremely challenging and it felt unachievable and at many points I felt like I don't want to do this anymore, I can't do this, I'm not going to be able to do it. So for those who know me, I had many health challenges starting in 2020 and last year when there was a lot of pressure to finalize the chapters, I was hit with COVID and I was on disability and I actually when I checked my laptop today, it was during that time when I was on disability that Vuyo was sending those emails. Where's Vuyo? <laughs> I can't see you Vuyo, <laughs> wherever you are, at the back there. And I actually responded while I was, you know, healing because in November and October I saw the dates there where we had to submit and where we had to work on these chapters. So for me, this is really a huge achievement. Um, I wasn't well, I wasn't able to do this, I wasn't able to continue, but with the encouragement of the, the colleagues and the editors, they pushed and, you know, they had patience. I never submitted on time due to those challenges, but they, they were very lenient um, in that regard. But many times I felt like, Look, can't I withdraw from this? I, I'm not going to be able to do this. So it was really a roller coaster year. Um, that's why I'm saying, you know, it's really a true miracle that I was able to, to finish off that. Um, and yes, Vuyo, up until the last, quite recently in October, where there was some little bits of work having to be done, I still tried to negotiate. 
And I remember it was a Saturday and my son was running in the athletics and I called Vuyo. I'm at the stadium trying to tell him I'm not able to do this now, Vuyo. And Vuyo was persistent. I need to submit this tomorrow <laughs> to the publishers. And um, when, I, when we went home from the athletics, I immediately got into the chapter and, and worked on it and was in constant contact with Vuyo. So, um, yeah, that was the process. It was really a challenging process, but I, I'm so glad that I could be part of this. Um, I feel honored to be part of this initiative and to, um, like uh, Prof. Goliath said earlier on, let me just check the words, she said, seed sprouting. And I think this is um, especially linked to my topic as well. This is how I see it. And then we look at the, um, okay. I want to also speak about what this means for me then. So being able to write the chapter also gave me a platform to share my voice. And you know, having a voice to be able to write as a woman, and especially as a woman, as a woman of color, this is often not something that's easy for us to do. Um, so this is, was a very meaningful experience for me. Um, you know, not having a voice as a child, as a young woman, and even sometimes in academic spaces. So this was a real uh, privilege and opportunity to be able to actually get my voice out there. But not only my voice, also being the voice for the voiceless, um, in terms of those who are suffering due to the social structures and injustices that we have in place. Um, and that is a lot. Uh, my, my chapter is linked to my PhD, and, and that is really the focus there as well. And I think the most important thing then is um, the product. So I want to end off with that. So my, my title is Breaking Down the Barriers to Mediation Practice in the South African Law System, the Experience of Unmarried Fathers. So that chapter really highlights the barriers to mediation practice in terms of the cultural barriers as well as the legal barriers that we have in our South African law system. Um, it also highlights the colonial roots um, in our justice system and actually the discrimination that we have in the system as well. So um, the inequalities amongst unmarried parents of children um, according to uh, the law actually is also highlighted there in, um, in that chapter as well. So the aim of my uh, chapter and as well as the research, you know, is also to empower those who are struggling, um, who are faced with injustices. And in this particular case, it is the unmarried fathers. Um, while they've been empowered by the law in terms of the Children's Act, they still find themselves to be powerless in terms of the experiences and what they are going through. And these experiences were even more challenging during the COVID pandemic. So my focus is on mediation and those who know me would know that I'm very passionate about mediation. And um, again, the mediation process that we follow in this country is really rooted in colonial and westernized models. So I advocate for more um, culturally relative um, approaches to mediation. And I just want to share a little example with you that really links to everything that, that I've written about last week and Thursday. I, um, I do mediation with a law clinic, NMU law clinic, and I was called to do a mediation. And this was exactly what, I, what I'm speaking about. It was cultural. It was a, a colored father and a cosa speaking lady. And to be able to come from a perspective where you're understanding the culture, where you're advocating everything that they brought to the table, all of the challenges, I was aware of these kinds of things linked to the research. And that mediation was such a successful one because I could implement what I'm advocating for already. You know, the parties came to that mediation not speaking to each other, not even wanting to look at each other. The father said to me, when I saw her in the waiting room, I wanted to say, hello, how are you? But I was too scared. But they left there on speaking terms, started a co-parenting relationship again, because we were able to work through all of these cultural things. And so I'm already implementing what I'm advocating for. And I think that was so meaningful for me there as well. So um, yeah. So, 
that's what I advocate for. We, we're looking for mediation models and approaches that are indigenous, um, using indi indigenous, indigenous knowledge systems. Um, the chapter also interrogates the current mediation practices as well as the law, and it questions whether we as social workers and mediators can, t can we truly say that family mediation is contributing to social justice when it, com when it comes to the parental responsibilities and rights of unmarried fathers in South Africa. So through that chapter, I'm, as Prof. Kulayat said, I have to go back to see what she said, sprouting the seeds, okay, so that we can start developing and so that we can start moving and changing in terms of how we approach when we work with families in this regard. So I say thank you once again to the editors for this opportunity and for this honor and for not giving up on me when I wanted to give up on myself. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Revolutionary greetings to you all. I want to start this session by disrupting the space. Is, is it okay to start a song? I don't see how we can um, launch a book of this nature. Do we have four lists in the house? Can I start a Feast Must Fall anthem? And would you help me sing this anthem? Can we all stand? <laughs> Gosi, Gosi, Sigelela, Sigelela, I Africa, Malo paga nisu, Malo paga, Lo paga nisu, Hondo loyo, Izwa imitanda zo. Maldonado Torres' concept of 
saluting those that came before us. I think whenever I'm in spaces like these, I realize that um, there are people, if you think about this place 100 years, 200 years, 300 years ago, there are indigenous people of this land, so I start by saluting them. And I also salute people in my family that came before me. Had it not been um, three, four generations of women in my family who came to the city of Johannesburg as domestic workers, I, I wouldn't be here. So I start by saluting and, and acknowledge uh, how challenging it was for them to walk this path. And um, I'm not really going to dwell on my chapter, um, which is the chapter that I authored, so authored, and my focus is on the imperative to decolonize knowledge formation in social work class. I want to focus more on the process and, and, and how it was for me to be in this space and to write with these amazing women who were editors of, of this book. And also just to congratulate you, Nivash, um, Anneline, and Viona for this amazing work and congratulate all the authors. Uh, the process for writing this chapter for me really emphasized the whole notion of writing as an intellectual process. That writing is indeed an intellectual process that can never be fast-tracked. Uh, and unfortunately, we are in spaces, um, academic spaces, where at the end of the year, you are asked how many outputs, um, how many papers, how many articles, how many book chapters. And I think the whole idea robs us of the opportunity to really engage in this intellectual <coughs> process. And this intellectual process that you can never, never, never fast track I often um, compare it to brewing an African beer, umkomboti. For those of you who've been in families where umakulu brew African beer, not African beer as ibabatoni or pineapple that you brew today and it's ready tomorrow. Umkomboti, where the process starts on a Wednesday, you know, and this beer will be enjoyed on a Saturday or Sunday. So if you think about brewing an African beer, really you can never take shortcuts. And you see on a Saturday morning, uh, when we say tamakul vumile, and, and this mkombo tea is, is brewed and it's beautiful and it's enjoyed, it's because the people that brew that African beer didn't take shortcuts. And, and therefore people can enjoy it, you know, and, 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 and the beauty and the wisdom and the conversation that happens in that space. And I also think about writing in that way. If we really think about writing the type of content that will be read by your grandchildren, Viona, and that will be read um, by your great-grandchildren, we have to think about a process and not taking shortcuts. And so I think as academics, we need to um, come up with a, a type of a disobedience where we say no to this a process of what I call a vending machine approach to writing. So in the institution where I'm at, um, there's this whole new thing of, OK, we're going to give you 40,000, get a teacher replacement, or get someone to mark, but by January, you must publish an article. And they will really harass you <laughs> if you don't get that article. Sometimes they go, say, attend a conference. Here's 20,000, here's 40,000. But next year, we want an article. So I see it as really a vending machine. They put money, and then they want an output immediately. <laughs> and, and really, how do you write quality work, type of work which is, is, is really thoughtful and you are engaging in it when you have to write under such pressure? So for me, uh, I believe that the, all the articles that were written in, in this book uh, will contribute to the body of knowledge. But I have no doubt 
that eight years from now, um, someone is going to look at those different chapters and read and they will enjoy. And the reason why they will enjoy that type of knowledge is because of the process that was undertaken when writing the book. So it was not a vending machine type of thing. The authors were very patient. And, 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 and even in the sessions that we had, as you get your feedback, the feedback among the peers, leaving the space, coming back to it. And I think there's something beautiful about the doing and the undoing, the writing and the leaving and coming back to it with fresh new eyes. And that was an experience. And I think it's up to us as, as academics to really put our foot down because we are the ones writing these papers and we know the type of pressure that we are all under and how university management because there's a also a capitalist component attached to it you know because with that one book chapter this is the amount that of money that the university is getting with that one general article that will be an exact amount that the university is getting so there's more pressure for academics to publish but how do we publish in a way that will ensure that we engage in this truly as um, an intellectual process so it is my appeal to you all as you read this book as you engage in this book and you enjoy it you remember that it was a process and a process and a process that really unfolded over a period of time and this book is just so relevant in this space and I have no doubt that it will be enjoyed by many for many years and on that note I'd like to thank you all Bring you greetings, um, our guests, from all of our authors that are sitting on the online space. And they asked if they would get the cocktail um, dinner and the decorations <laughs> and the space that we're occupying as well. So from uh, the colleagues that are on the online space, our family members, uh, our friends that can't be here with us um, because we have tentacles all over the country and the world, we greet you and we greet them and we say um, please feel welcome. So um, I think as Claudia has said that starting with song and acknowledging our ancestry is so very important. And so in the incubators project as Annalene alluded to, we usually would start with lighting this candle that starts to uh, that stays lit for the duration of that incubation so it is to actually bring in the spirit that we carry uh, from the generations that have left us so i want to just acknowledge our light that we have in front as well as an editor i want to say very very little <clears throat> and the little that i want to say is that um as an editor in this process and as an author, what I learned um, through the process is that I need to acknowledge my privilege in every space that I find myself in. Although my privilege may be relative, but I still occupy a position of privilege and I must acknowledge it. Going further, I need to state my positionality in every space that I find myself in, especially as a social worker and as an <coughs> academic, that if I am not true and honest, authentic about who I am, what position I occupy, then that service will never be authentic. So if I am to enter a space to do work with communities, I need to then enter as a partner and to ask permission, to seek permission uh, to be part of the process and never as an expert. Because knowledge gained through the Western canons of thought can never render us in the academy as experts. So I leave you with that as an editorial note, but then I want to read three excerpts from the book from authors that are not here, two are from authors that are not here, and the two themes that they cover, one is um, Afrocentricity and spirituality, and the second one is landlessness, 
and I'm speaking from the authors that's not here on landlessness because I want to acknowledge our authors that are here on landlessness, which is Dr. Mzeleni Pedro and uh, Vuyo Diko. So I start by, by talking through what my brother Sipo writes about. He says in respect of ancestry, that the African understanding of death is closely related to their knowledge of kinship, with, de with death viewed as devoid of complete separation from the family. In tandem with this assertion, there are three significant aspects that make ancestors unique in the African context. Firstly, the kinship ties that existed before the departure of the family members is viewed as sustained and not extinguished. Unlike the Western view of death as an end, death in the African context involves a sense of continuity. In contrast and emphasizing the continual existence and the role of the ancestors in the world of the living from the African context, Mbiti describes the departed as the living dead. This conception sustains the view that the departed remains part of the living. Significant in the conception of ancestors from the African perspective is that the term is uttered in plural terms. The element of community rather than individualism remains. Another aspect of importance is the relationship and attachment that Africans have with the land. As Mzama asserts, this is the very reason why in many parts of the African world, the departed or as Mbiti asserts, the living dead are buried within the homestead. These attachments go beyond the fact that the family homesteads serve as burial places for ancestors. They also serve as the locality where family rites and rituals are held, with the ancestors often consulted as they are viewed as playing a role in family situations. And from that, which Sitole writes in this book, I move to the land question, which Zibonele writes about. He says that land ownership is a social challenge that creates complex problems in South Africa, which social workers must equate analytically with the daily lived experience brought to and been well documented. Secondly, there is a lack of proper housing, with the housing backlog being 2.3 million in 2014 and rising and there have been escalating community protests over housing. One of the most damaging aspects of land ownership in a constitutionally principled country like South Africa is women's land ownership. More than 60% of women in Southern Africa are dependent on land for their livelihoods. Despite the importance of land to women in the sub-region, customary land rights discriminate against their land rights. A continuing social problem social workers need to address on land ownership for African women is the statutory and customary laws which seem to favor male ownership of property, disadvantaging women. To address issues related to women's land ownership in social work practice, the factors constraining women from acquiring land rights, like in other countries, must be attended to. And he further goes on to give us examples of how social workers may do that. I end with the last reading, which is from my own chapter, which is entitled Laying the West to Rest. And it talks to higher education and the role of the academic in the higher education space. And so I um, disruptively start by writing to say that I will write how I like, because Steve Biko said he will write what he likes. So when we look at, at leaving this academy, what will be the legacy that we will leave, and how will we be judged by history? So the foundations of a social work curriculum in South Africa must be rebirthed from a deep appreciation of African living, African culture, and African values as its embryo. In so doing, as academics, we must fearlessly engage in critical self-reflection for the purpose of including students' lived realities as the basis for transforming social work education. We must acknowledge the unique role that we play in leading education in a profession that is rooted in upholding human rights and social justice. Hence, in the near future, 
when critically conscious social work students gather to lay rocks on the graves of the West, they will say that they were academics who, who upheld epistemic and social justice, glorified human rights, and magnified human dignity. They will acknowledge the strides we took alongside them, promoting their agency to theorize their own existence, continually informing curricula, curriculum development and practice. And they will persistently invoke the spirits of Steve Biko, Franz Fanon, and Paula Freire when they enter colonized spaces of learning, because they will hold the most powerful weapon of oppression in their own hands, their free minds. Then we will know that our academic responsibilities were fulfilled. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are 30 minutes behind schedule, um, but now Kali spoke to you about the process that we followed. So I'm really, I'm pleading for your indulgence tonight. Uh, it is an incredibly big moment and we want to do justice <coughs> to everyone that's been given an opportunity to speak. We are respectful and mindful of your time, so wanting to immediately invite our respondent, um, Mr. Apiwe Ntloko. Apiwe is a social worker, he is one of our own graduates from Mandela University and he is a PhD candidate and social work activist, Apiwe. Wakwanchoko and the Umlam, and the Umbing, and the Kakaza, and the Ukibel, and the Uport, and the Umtach, and the Wogas, and the Sulana Sasaman Pingin, Owa, or Senzo, the Limpondomi sent me up, the Ukasi, and the Munonza, and the Kandanyawan, and the Ababiza, the Bandabatala, Abandleo, Eli, Iminyanya, and Amalosi, the Tamakush. Uh, I was greeting to everyone. Uh, good evening uh, to all the colleagues and the editors and the authors. Um, I'm given a task uh, which was not so easy for me uh, because firstly, it's my first time attending a book launch. Secondly, it's my first time being a respondent. Uh, I hope I'll do justice uh, responding to the book. That was very interesting. Um, and evoked emotions uh, in me. Uh, firstly, I want to say uh, to everyone so that we understand that social work is political. Social work is ideological. But currently, how we practice social work, it does lack the politics. It is political because it was used as a political tool to colonize us. It was used as a political tool and an ideological tool to take the land from us. So the book was beautifully written uh, by my colleagues, which um, left me asking myself, what is social work in Africa? Uh, but when I, I translated back to English, uh, it means living well. Is that really social work in Africa or in South Africa? Maybe that's a question that we also need to still ponder on and answer. Um, since we are beginning now uh, to speak our mind, to speak our voice, and to bring the relevance of uh, Africa within social work. So for me, when I read the book, uh, the book speaks for the voiceless, uh, for the silence, the marginalized, and the undermined because of their skin color. My colleagues have beautifully already mentioned uh, these aspects um, on this podium. And for me, for the first time, black social workers, students and associates have managed to address the black condition, to document the existential conditions and crises that black people grapple with on a daily basis in South Africa. And the current social work methods are unable to respond to. So black people have often deni been denied the legitimacy as intellectual beings who possess the agency to construct 
their own interventions and inform even the social work interventions. I'm just giving you a background before I tell you more about what the book says and how I understand the book. Uh, so black people in social work writing and thinking have largely been viewed without voices and without stories because a lot of literature that is available is a return of course by our white colleagues who are leading in the field. So when I read the book, I was joyful because it's written by black people. And the intention of excluding our colleagues who are white predominantly have uh, well established in writing, I think that was something significant and needed within the field because our confidence has not been there because we are scared of these other people or dominant scholars who write so well, are well articulate, and seemingly, uh, to some extent, gatekeepers in the industry. So for me, the book challenges the hierarchy of knowledge production and centers Africans as thinking beings. Because as African people, we've been viewed as non-beings, as people with, uh, without the mental faculties uh, to develop our own uh, interventions, our own paradigm, our own theories, to solve the problems that we grapple with on a daily basis. So the book does challenge the dominant status quo. Um, and what I like about the blue book is that um, the black people have collectively, particularly black women, came together to address the issue that we are facing within the academy. Because black women in the academic space are rendered non-beings and are not taken for granted. So it's something that is significant to see the black women voices in the book asserting themselves, but also asserting the black story. So the book does challenge the notion um, about black women in South Africa um, who remain consumers of knowledge rather than the knowledge producers. So what I enjoyed and I liked seeing from the book is that they have came up with knowledge, but not just knowledge from abstract, but evidence-based knowledge. As um, Dr. Uh, Razia Lakhadin was saying here, that the chapter is based on the dissertation on the PhD which there is evidence, there has been research. It's not only the thinking or the abstract theory, but it's what the people on the ground are saying they want to see happening within these spaces. For far too long, the available literature has been imposing these interventions, which are individualistic, which are Eurocentric. So I enjoyed really getting these sustainable solutions to the African problems <coughs> and they are addressing what the people have uh, been saying that social work is ineffective. Uh, so the book for me has taken the direction of um, epistemic disobedience. Um, and this was not a militant act, but it was to ensure that <laughs> as black people, we hear the voices and we are represented, we tell our own stories. And I like the fact that the book is not so predictable, it's not linear, and the structure is a free flow structure. When you read chapter one, it doesn't give you maybe the idea that chapter two is about this, or it's a flow from chapter one up until chapter 14. But you can start the book anywhere and still understand the book and get the content. And I like that because and normally uh, when we write, we conform to these standards that it needs to follow the structure. It needs to look like they do from the West. So the book has really done justice in drawing the existential conditions that our people grapple with. And it is worth noting from my side that the academy, by the way, was not made with a black person in the mind. Hence then, for me, it was very critical that black people were united in writing this book and were united in constructing the practice modalities suited to the African social system. Because it speaks to Umtu, it speaks to Ubuntu Beitu, it speaks to Isintu, 
So the book has started reimagining knowledge production in social work. It has started reimagining the knower and it has started reimagining knowing within social work. Because for far too long, the knower has been the worst. And knowing or the education or the knowledge that we know, it's the one from the West which was parachuted and imposed to us. So from now onwards, the point of departure is for us to tell our own stories. And that's what I enjoyed about the book. And that's what, what the book has addressed or is proposing and bringing to um, the School of Social Work. It is addressing the issues of um, alienation, uh, dismissal of black people as primary beneficiaries of social welfare and social work services in South Africa. When I was still a student, I remember reading Potter, I remember reading Veyers, I remember reading other textbooks which would quote and make examples about Mississippi. And I enjoyed reading the book and understanding that the research was conducted at Kabeha. And the people that were speaking, maybe Tetisi Kosa, and others were speaking Africans, which spoke to me because it's contextual and it's relatable. And this is what we needed in the social work field. So the authors have really acknowledged and recognized the capacity of black people to create their own home and to tell their own stories. So this is the beginning of an era for me, which black people and academics collectively produce counter knowledge in education, practice, and research. So the book for me is talking back to the system and is fighting back and is advocating for the black voices and is advocating for the relevant contextual and relatable um, interventions which speak to our needs, which speaks to our culture, which speaks to our realities in the ground. So through this text and uh, the subsequent contextual practices, black people will no longer feel out of space. Because as it is currently, the client system out there, the social workers who are rendering the services, remain feeling out of space, out of place. Because what they are taught in class is not what is there in reality. Because they will tell you in class that you sit up squarely, your posture, your dress code. But when you go to the community, you are an outsider by virtue of dressing in this corporate white feel, going to the community and coming as an expert. So for me, the book responds to the, to the comment uh, made by uh, Professor Grace, um, which says, without constant confrontation, we contribute to our own slaughter. So if we continue as black people to remain complicit to the epistemic injustice, we are part of the problem. Hence then, I like that the colleagues took a stand and not just spoke because usually we like workshopping, talk shops and all that. But now we've done something different of writing a book which will be prescribed within the social work curriculum and which will be used by the student. And the examples that are used are examples that students will relate, if even the clients uh, will relate with. So for me, Ngesin to Lenoad Likiza is a young Abandabam Nyama in South Africa. Uh, it's medication uh, to the nation, particularly for black people. It's medication to the social workers because when they read it, they will understand that these are the examples we work with. These are the cases we deal with. And these are the methods that we should be using in intervening within the communities that we serve. So it does respond to the deadly silence African people, particularly black, are subjected to within the academy and practice. So the book demonstrates that African black social workers actually do have a voice and they can speak. When I speak about South African black social workers, I am not speaking about the ministers because usually that's the view. <laughs> so
So let me remind you, as my colleagues have said here, that social work as we know it currently is a settler colonial project which was used for social control and it was used rightfully so to address the white poverty in South Africa. Similar to the approach that we currently use, which is social development, it remains problematic. And I hope in future we will also uh, address that. So currently social work lacks the relevance, it's ineffective, and the book does very well in capturing this. An example is used within the courtroom. The solutions that are provided in the courtroom do not favor the most subjected people or affected people and do not solve the African problems because they are informed by the Eurocentric ways of doing and thinking. What are Roman Dutch laws in South Africa <coughs> guiding South African social workers in mediation, even in the criminal justice processes? So the book for me was necessary to bring that um, awareness to everyone that this is the challenge and this is what we need to do. Because currently, an example that is used in the book, there's power imbalances within the magistrate, the lawyers, the social workers. Because as social workers, we are not seen as professionals because the power remains within the custodians, which is the law, which is honestly the white people in South Africa. So a question to ponder on currently, who are the custodians of law in South Africa? Uh, you can answer that question on your own time. Uh, so reading the book, you will understand that there are complex issues that contribute to alcohol abuse within colored community. Therefore, context is important when working with Africans, when working with African families. With the South African history of dispossession and apartheid, you cannot solve the current problems with the Eurocentric individualistic approaches, which are uninformed by the contextual backgrounds. And the book does highlight and demonstrate that and offers alternative approaches that can be used to solve these African problems. And these interventions or approaches are relevant to our own values as African black people. Uh, the book calls for social work practitioners, students and academics to always consider the person within the environment. And for me, that's the general theme I get throughout the book. Even if we speak about women empowerment, the rights of unmarried fathers, the parental involvement within the criminal justice processes, the context is always crucial because that's where the people are coming from and that's where the problem arises. Because we have some problems because South Africans are landless, particularly black people. So the book highlights that black people, particularly the social work client system, struggle because they are landless and social workers' voices are silent about this. The book has questioned the role of social work practice, the profession, and the practitioners in spatial planning and in human settlement because you will seldom hear social workers' voices speaking about the land question or addressing the land question, addressing the issues of human settlement, because social workers are always used as an appendix. When there's a problem, we only react. So the book does now in ask us to be proactive in addressing and engaging with these problems the community sits with. The book has beautifully outlined that the current practice methods remain Eurocentric, individualistic, and not contextual. And most importantly, they are alienating and dehumanizing. Hence then, it becomes important for us to understand the context so that the approaches are humanizing and are relevant within the context that we serve our people. What became clear from reading the book for me is that social work is still far removed from the communities they serve. And an example that I can use, you can go across the towns or cities. Where are the social work offices? They are in town, not in the communities. So they are not embedded or grounded within the community. Hence, some of them, there were incidences here, social workers were robbed 
because of they are doing home visits. People are not familiar with social workers. They don't know them because they are outsiders. Because the model that they are practicing, it's a model that is taken somewhere in Europe. So the questions that I also ask myself, what is the potential role of social work students in the broader scheme of things within this book? What is it that you can learn from the book and what it is that you can do? You can refer to the chapter that is written by a student as well within this book and that's what I enjoyed. Um, it's, um, I'm not sure the pronunciation, but it's a written reporter uh, who, who, who takes a, a proactive stance in talking back to the system and contributes towards transform it, transforming um, the current practices. Because the student and the supervisor challenge the deficit discourse around students from low socioeconomic backgrounds. In Pula Zikalu within the spaces of university, we always see our people as people without an agency, as students who need to be empowered. We don't appreciate that they also have a thinking capacity. They also have the strengths. You can also check the interventions available at the universities are always there to help the black people transition into this white system. But no interventions to transform and change the university so that it accommodates these black young students coming to the university. So a question then that I have and that we can all consider is the question around spirituality and social work. Because in Africa, we are one with our own environment. We are one with our own ancestors. We are one with our own spirituality. But the current practice methods always bring spirituality at the end and currently it's not considered within the interventions that are offered. It's only in recent years when they speak about even the biopsychosocial and spiritual framework, because you can already see that it's by the way and it becomes an appendix. Even when we speak about culture within social work, it becomes an appendix, because now we speak about culture-sensitive social work, whereas social work should be grounded and foregrounded within the culture that our people exist in. So this book intends to correct the mistake that has been done by the Eurocentric um, social work and even the authors that are leading within the space, writing from the West view. Because for far too long, Africans, South Africans have been viewed from the colonizer's perspective with the colonizer's eyes. And as I'm closing, um, I'm reminded of the speaker's contribution. I also wish to add that history shall absolve us. History shall absolve all the authors, the editors, and the contributors, because we are the ones who are paving the way. And I salute everyone who has contributed to this book. And this should be the beginning of great things, should be the beginning of transforming social work as a profession and reimagining the curriculum and even the practice methods that we train the students to implement out there. I thank you. much Akpiwe. We now, ladies and gentlemen, we really thank you for your patience. We're now going to open for questions and answers. So this is, we've been talking the whole evening, so this is an opportunity really for us to hear your voices, your questions, and um, we have an online audience as well, participants that will, will watch the screen for the questions, and um, we've got a roving mic, so can I just see by indication of hands? We've got a question there. Um, and thank you very much to the Canada team for helping us with the mics. Philip, will you indicate if there are questions? Sure. We've got one question. Can I just see? Uh, let's take a round of three questions. We've got one. Are there more hands? Yeah. 
Okay, let's start with the question that we do have. Thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, thank you. I just want to congratulate you, first of all, for this amazing work that you have started and which is necessary for the humanity, uh, global humanity for that matter, because most people still need answers that are coming from very contextualized ways of understanding of this. Um, I just want to talk about two things. One, um, I, I really appreciate the healing methodologies that you have applied in uh, nurturing the writing process, because most people don't talk about the writing process, but want the ideas to be out there, especially under the current order of things, whereby things must be done fast and out there. So, that um, methodology that is healing, that is affirming, and also that is seeking to promote more voices into the humanizing project, in a way. So thank you so much for that. One, my question is around the idea of um, the bureaucratic constraints that maybe the profession tends to encounter especially from the professional organizations that you have to deal with daily. Is that covered in the book? Because that is part, I think, of what defines the curriculum. Who teaches and how many students are in the classroom? So I don't know if you have uh, uh, attended to that question, or maybe you can just talk to us in terms of the implications of pushing this kind of knowledge for the bureaucratic structures that still, in a way, uh, push for a particular kind of voice uh, inside the profession. Congratulations, colleagues. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have another hand before we go for a response? We also have a question online, so maybe I must just ask one of my colleagues to respond and then I will um, read this question and we can respond to it. So I think on this question, Annalene, we'll pass it on to Clali because she's written in the area of not using the banking approach to knowledge production. Thank you for that question. I think um, when it comes to our profession, we have really outlined, um, we now talk about norms and, not norms and standards, is it norms and standards now? Norms and standards, and I think there um, is somewhere where it talks about the context, um, uh, covering indigenous issues, but I don't think we go into much depth, and that is why even in the, the type of work that we are beginning to do um, in, in projects that we'll be announcing soon, we are going deeper and interrogating this, not just as a tick box exercise, um, because we're seeing this approach when you talk about indigenizing, um, Africanizing, we find that the same approach that institutions use um, as a tick box, a tick box exercise where they just put the word university in African languages and that's a sign that they are transforming curriculum or transforming institutions. But there is not much greater depth. So I think there is still more room to go deeper in unpacking this. In my chapter, I talk about um, uh, um, bringing students into uh, knowledge creation and I make a very practical example of a situation that I experienced in class in 1998 as a first year student at university where a professor was talking to us about Bantu education and half of the people who were in this, that class were, had first hand experience with Bantu education and the professor um, was teaching without engaging us. And if you look at who is the expert in that room, who was the expert to share that information, because we, for all our lives, as, as, as learners, black learners, 
were in Bantu education. Here we had a professor was telling us what is written in the books about um, uh, Bantu education. So what I'm doing in my work is to really seeing students as people that come from a knowledge system and that knowledge system that is valid, you know. So I think I, in a way there is work that still needs to be done, but I think uh, the standards from the profession do acknowledge that there's a need to do, but there's much more than is needed. Thank you. Yeah, if I can also just add to that, that there isn't a chapter that speaks explicitly to that question, but it's certainly embedded in chapters. So, for example, my chapter speaks about that effectiveness in drug prevention is measured by how many drug prevention sessions you've done, how many people were in the room, you know, so that shows your effectiveness if you've gone to roll this out, etc. And that disobedience we are calling for is to disrupt that notion. That effectiveness would actually mean that you've gone to first see what does the community know? Because they can teach you a lot better about drug prevention, you know, how things change hands, etc. So it's starting with what the community is saying and then rebutting those measures that are imposed upon us. The, uh, can I go? You can, I, can I just quickly respond? I think just a last on that as well. And like I said, there's not a specific chapter or specific speaking about that. But I think it's when we talk about, you know, especially with some of those uh, chapters that uh, speaks to policy and, 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 quite, and with land and, and, and all of those, it speaks to the alienation, you know, of the existing knowledges that actually alienate and it's not able to reach the real issues that people are having. And in that way, I think it is, so, so we are still stuck. I think one, th one awareness that we have in the writing is that we're very much stuck in the everyday work that we are doing, but speaking to that alienation and how we think doesn't work. That helps. Thank you. There's a question on the Zoom platform. I'll just read it and then we can respond to it. So the question is, how does one combine traditional practice with social work practice? as it is taught at universities. Often communities have solutions of how things should be solved to deal with the scourges we face today. How do we bring these traditional practices into the curriculum? Um, thank you, Bernie, so much for that question. I'll, I'll start responding, and then my colleagues can just indicate if you want him to respond to that as well. So I think tonight's event, uh, we were hoping demonstrate uh, we really wanted to break a tradition of what the book launch should look like, although it might be the first for some of us, um, and, and that we had the Imbongi, you know, opening it, acknowledging the spirit you've heard, Navashni, um, lighting the candle, etc. So, so that for us is at the center of how you enter spaces that you that you acknowledge and recognize the space into which you, you enter. And so the same with our client systems, um, you know, that we first understand what, are, what is it that people have been doing for ages and that we don't proclaim to know better when we enter their terrain, that this is their terrain, we're being invited in. And we have to wait to hear if we welcome first and then understand why they've been working in those communities for decades. You know, we sit with people and we learn. And then together we bring those, um, the lenses are created of what would be the best way to go forward. Um, so Bernie, that is the short answer in terms of the traditional practice. There's several examples in the text, you know, in particular um, authors, uh, Navash, uh, Razia had also spoken to what she had said, so I'm going to invite you to buy the book to go into that depth. You see now my role is a marketer too. So that you can interrogate and see there are very practical examples that authors have given of how traditional practice really is foregrounded. Thank you, Bernie. Navashni? Mm. So in the, in the social work space, in academia itself, uh, breaking the barriers within the classroom. I think that's where it starts um, in terms of practice. Because first we teach in the classroom, we um, professionally educate the student to go out and to practice. And so in, in terms of that question where it's asking how do we incorporate traditional practice within social work practice, we have to bring it into education firstly. And how do we do that? Because our classrooms are 
full with rich knowledge and heritage. So it's the same thing that Claudia just said, inviting the voices and creating those spaces where students become partners in the knowledge production uh, space. So what are their problems? What are people's problems? How were they responded to in, in historical times? How are they responded to? In some instances, I think we even do assignments where we would say, go and ask your granny, what are these things that used to be done before? Because they've forgotten it. Students have forgotten it also because of being in a Western basic education system. So, so that's my short version. Thanks, Fiona. Um, and then Bernie has also responded, thank you Bernie, this is the way we need it, uh, that case studies would be critical to demonstrate. And I think Bernie, Bernie is the director of ICALA Trust, um, and they really are instrumental of working at the heart and with communities on ground level. So absolutely those case studies generated in and by communities is, um, is what we should be working with. And as the Vashni said, our students give us those live case studies by sharing their own experiences. We have a, you have a question? Sure. Um, there and then behind as well. Uh, good afternoon to everyone uh, in the book launch. So I'd like to ask a question to Mr. To Mr. Toho. So I heard this input and I really appreciate what he had said. So I'd like to ask with, with regards to the law now, he had mentioned that you know we need to investigate you know, the custodians of the law in South Africa. You know, it's, it's really amazing to hear that. So the question that I had was that now, you know, what does he maybe think, you know, uh, from from the from, from social worker point, point of view, you know, about the work that has been done by the ANC with regards to the constitution of the country. So do, does he maybe think, do, does he think that it works for the people? Do you think that we should change it entirely? Or what do you think, what do you think about also the preamble of the constitution that we have? You know, the preamble of the constitution in the Republic of South Africa reads as, we, the people of South Africa, recognize the injustices of our past, Honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land. Respect those who have worked to build and develop our country and believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. We therefore, through our freedom, through our freely elected representatives, adopt this constitution as the supreme law of the Republic. So, you see, as a born free now, so I was, I was just, you know, asking myself, how do you heal a country like South Africa, you know? Because outside it's, you know, it's hectic outside. So it's nice to sit in a nice room like this and talk about all the wonderful things that are happening. But outside, you know, things are not orderly, you know, are not in order. So uh, I would like to ask, what do you think about, you know, the constitution that the ANC uh, comrades has, has, you know, worked on together with other, you know, with other, with other organizations to, to come up with the laws and to also, you know, influence what has been on the Constitution. Thank you very much. Okay, so before Apiwe answers, I'm just going to ask Nazi. you also have a question? Thank you. Um, good evening, colleagues. Uh, I don't have a question, actually, I just have a comment. Uh, first to call my colleagues, I'm Nozi Makwan, I'm a social worker in private practice. I'm just grateful about this book because it gives, um, I think, an open space for us in private practice where we sometimes caught in the methods of intervention that we know from class. And then when you get to meet with the actual client, um, you need to consider the cultural aspects of that client so that you can be, be able to holistically assist the client. So I see this book has considered that and I'm really interested to read more. And um, in, in, the, in these um, years or past months so, it's been um, popular with um, students experiencing um, children or clients with challenges within their families where there is no intervention in the book that they need to assist. So this also comes what I just said, Kutin. 
and it really opens a, a flow and an opportunity for us and the students to be able to use practices like your genograms where you look at families and um, it also speaks about the ABC um, asset-based community uh, which really for me it will help really the communities to bring up and recognize more on our intervention because we're focusing on what they can do, what they believe in, and also bring our academic experiences or thoughts or what we're taught academically in terms of assisting and improving uh, their clients, uh, our clients. So yeah, I'm just interested now to understand and see how uh, in future the gap between our profession and other professions will be bridged where we also recognize the same level with your accountants and your and the lawyers. So that's what I'm really looking forward to and if it will be uh, in the future be able to be bridged that gap. So thank you so much colleagues. Um, I'm interested and I'll buy a copy in support and also to learn more and empower myself. Thank you so much then. Thank you. Um, Father BC, somebody says that the sound is muted on the online platform. So we're going to give up here an opportunity to respond um, whilst the mic is making its way. But yeah, I'm just acknowledging your question um, in terms of how do we start at a personal level when students come from communities that are broken and struggling. So maybe just to link to what Navashni had responded, it's really about, it's about conscientization. So the types of assignments and the reflective invitations we give our students is really to heighten their level of awareness, you know, conscientizing them so that they can stay, step away from those experiences and understand it for themselves first. And then once that sense making is taking place, um, you know, I think they're better able then to respond to communities in similar positions as well. Mr. Um Thanks for the question. Um, and I think that's a necessary question. Um, firstly, I think I would borrow from Umar Jengozi, uh, who characterizes South Africa as a neo-apartheid state. Uh, we are post-1994, but still living in apartheid, even though it's not defined as such, uh, but the living conditions such as so. So in terms of the constitution, uh, it sounds beautiful, but in practice, uh, we remain um, subjected uh, to these um, being rendered non-beings. I'll make an example with practice. Um, I think Unati Filita is somewhere here. I saw him, my field supervisor, uh, who can also attest that as social workers going to court, firstly, we are not taken serious as a profession and professionals. So the law currently, what needs to happen, it's a collective approach from my side because social workers cannot contest the law alone, whereas we also have lawyers uh, that also use this law. So it's a collective South African intervention that needs to happen so that we address whatever issues and challenges that we're facing. Yes, the preamble sounds so good and um, uh, does um, lay a foundation for the reader to understand where the constitution is coming from or how it was drafted. But in reality and practice, there's always um, a contrast uh, between the two. Because the law says this, but the practice says something else. But at the same time, some of the laws are infringing on other rights. An example that was made by Dr. Lahatin, um, it's around mediation, um, also the rights of the unmarried fathers, because those people still uh, don't uh, get their rights being recognized. So it's all about also the practice, interpretation of the law, the implementation, but overall, all these stakeholders or parties that are involved need to take a stand and collectively address the issue that we face uh, today. So I hope I captured you. Platform. There's a couple of them on YouTube. YouTube. There's two questions on YouTube. YouTube. Okay. Uh, in what way does the book address the issue of African identity as well as African uh, Renaissance? 
that was from Norman de Kawa. And another question about uh, um, how does the book reflect the issue of indigenous languages with respect to interpreting academic discipline? And so each of the colleagues would like to respond. Dali, would you like to respond to All right. Um, thanks. Thanks for the questions. I will, I will uh, address the first question because reading the book, um, an example is made um, by Matebane uh, speaking about Umdeni Osapo, a family, and African identity, because these things are not the same. <clears throat> a family in English, we are told that it's a nuclear family. The parents and the kids. And then, in the African context, umdeni usapo means my whole family. We do not have an extended family as Africans. We have families. But the West tells us that your mom and your father um, are the only family you need or system that is your nuclear family or family. So even the term family is interrogated in the book and it's further challenged to say we need to use our own terms and concepts so that our people can relate and understand what we mean as it because it doesn't translate to family. Family is something else because it's Western and it speaks about just a subunit. Also, this is visible in some of the chapters which speak about um, the law and social work, the criminal justice system, in which in some instances uh, the law says the biological father, the biological mother needs to be present, or the mom or the father. Whereas Abanya Bantwana are not raised by their biological parents, but the family, because you belong to Amatete, which is a clan name now, they can also represent you. Because when we practice tradition, if I'm in PE and I come, may, for example, from Mtata, and I need a particular rite of passage or something to be done traditionally. I can easily locate a machete in Kabeha that can render or do the ceremony for me. So that's the identity that is also reflected and demonstrated within the text. So thank you. For that language question now in, in that way when you express because I think the Matebani chapter specifically speaks about that inability to translate in understanding and when he for instance uh, addresses issues around how does a family then how does this unit deal with a young person with Down syndrome he then speaks specifically about because that translation and because because of that, mis that, that lack of understanding that comes into who the family is really in this context. So your existing knowledges of how the family needs to respond to it gets missing in translation. And it cannot, it cannot incorporate the, 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 the traditional understanding of what is already happening within this family. I cannot for myself explain in the words, the way you've explained it, but I think that specifically, that response there, speaks to exactly that difficulty in the lack of the knowledge that we are having. Maybe I can just comment on something, because this is a journey, and I can guarantee you that this book does not give you all the answers. You know, if the book can create more questions, then maybe the book is actually serving its purpose as well. One of the things that seems to happen within this, in the, the, the South African social work context in academia is looking at a dictionary that is, is the development of a dictionary with all different uh, 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 universities around the, the country needs to get involved to incorporate and to contribute, especially from the areas where they are located, so that we can develop a kind of you know, a vocabulary that really incorporates the people that we work with, you know, so that they can that, that they can be heard and seen and that the student can respond to that. So these are some of the things that we are having there. But yeah, like I said, this is this for me is a beginning. Yeah. And there's a lot that needs to happen. And maybe our students as they are sitting there, you know, might be some of the people who write that third and that fourth book, etc., that takes this forward. Okay.
program because I know that we are we are way over our time so we now will have Mr. Alan Zinn who is from the Nelson Mandela University Press and whilst he's making his way um, after Mr. Zinn we will have the DVC of Research Innovation and Internationalization Dr. Tandi Mkwebe and thank you for being a true African parent to arrange with neighbors to get your child <laughs> <laughs> because we were, yeah, uh, your child was stranded, and thank you very much for for being able to do that. And then at the end of of her closing comments, we will have Mr. Voyodiko, as you heard, have been a tyrant to all of us. So then he will come and do the vote of thanks. Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Viona, and. Um, I'm, I'm going to be, to be brief, you know, to catch up with a bit of time. Um, so firstly, uh, to say greetings to everybody and uh, to DVC Tandi, DVC Andre that side and everybody else. Um, this is a lovely occasion um, and uh, there was something that was said earlier about the birthing process and I, I wrote this thing and I said, the birthing of the book felt so easy from my side, um, but then of course I'm a I'm a male and I'm a you know imposter in in, in that sort of process, and uh, but of course that is in in relation to to working with the team. It has been really great uh, working with the the, the co co editors, so uh, they really made it uh, made it feel easy. I think uh, for for me this is uh, something um, that we. Uh, exposing, I would say, almost uh, for the first time at the university. We've been working for the past year and a bit uh, behind the scenes um, on the press, and um, there are there are two books that have come out under the imprint, under the name, that uh, uh, logo name there, and uh, they both happen to be from the Faculty of, of Health Sciences. Very interesting. Uh, so well done to the faculty. Um, so, you, so do I just do I just touch it here? <laughs> okay. So what uh, what I want to explain is that we uh, we are working very closely with uh, with African Sun Media. They are based in uh, the Stellenbosch area in uh, in Cape Town, and um, these are some titles that we've done that we've been working with before that that have now. Um, you know, they've, uh, they've gravitated over to the Mandela University Press. And um, so there's this sort of process happening at the, the moment. Um, but we'll be bringing the press much more formally into, into the Mandela space um, going, going forward. Um, I'll touch it again. <laughs> just, just there. Okay. So that is the... The first book that that was um, was published, Professor Cheryl Walter actually is one of the key authors, and um, you may know that they you know sport, uh, sport or physical education or human movement as we know it was those teachers were removed from schools in the process part of the process that was that had happened in in the in the, in the country. Uh, with the exception of possibly Model C schools and private schools, uh, etc. And so this is an attempt to bring uh, human movement into the classroom via teachers in that phase, and they're now working on a second book uh, from grades 4, 2 to 7, actually. Okay, and then, um, just one again. And so we come to this important book. Um, a very important book, as you have heard tonight. And um, it's really um, going to be, be contributing hugely into the field. And we want to say thank you to the author, chapter authors, there are 14, to the, the editors for the, the work that, that's been, been done. And um, we know that this work is going to encourage others. 
You know, there are people sitting here and they seeing, hey, possibly I can also do it, and I can work with uh, some others to, um, you know, to get there. So we really want to to encourage you to speak to people who've been been thinking about publishing and writing um, to actually do it. There's going to be a um, a bumper series of launches next year. There are quite a few books that are. Well, they're going to press as we're talking here now and early in the new year. The Faculty of Health of, uh, of Humanities is next. Dr. Bina Babawa Makakwana sitting over there. Uh, Center for Women and, and, and Gender Studies. They have a wonderful book coming out in the new year. So um, I want to say that, yes, we're going to be finding that, you know, there's going to be probably every month there's going to be another launch. So, um, just, you know, Annaline, you know, and, uh, 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 and Navashni, to you and to, you know, to Viona, well done. Uh, you really put us on, on the map. I must thank you for choosing the Mandela University Press. I mean, we're this baby, you know, you're taking a big chance with us to, um, you know, to publish with us. But uh, we wanted to, to say, say thank you for that, and uh, there are a couple of people sitting in this room here that are part of the Mandela University Press Board, and uh, we are very, very glad that you, that you did that. Thank you so much, and please buy the book, <laughs> family, friends, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, please don't be, don't be shy to, um, to do that. Andre, do you want to say something? Yes, but yeah. I actually wanted to stay away from the mic because mm. of the conflict of interest. Andre Andre is the is the, the chairperson of the, the press of the board, eh? Yeah, so over to you. Yeah. Now I, I wanted to, to just add uh, and sorry for this, Alan and, and colleagues, that the imprint have, have a, a few strands and the this is actually the first intellectual scholarly. A book in the strand of academic work yeah. and, and because our university really wants to be in service of society we will have the types of books that uh, that Ellen has shown here with regard to how we engage with schools and other social spaces and then of course Ellen just as an advertisement as well that we also have a strand that will emerge around community publishing, okay? We will have, where we will have members of the community that would like to write narrative stories, of course, that will be outside of the academic imprint as well. So we will have three or even more strands under the Mandela University print, okay? The scholarly intellectual strand, which may actually then later on have to subsidize some of the community writing, okay, which we will also would like to, to, to provide uh, uh, you know, uh, opportunities for. I'm just thinking here yeah, about this great creative work that's being done in our communities, the poetry, and that line of work that needs to be published as well. And we, and we don't want to be a, a, a publishing imprint that simply chase the questions of sub research subsidies and, and these kinds of financial modelings, but want to have a cross subsidization where we support you know, community uh, writing work uh, as well. And I just wanted to make that particular point, Ellen, you know, because we have young people that, and other people within communities, so do approach us whenever you have any. We actually had a submission on bird life as well, eh? Uh, in, 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 in South Africa, eh? written in uh, different sets of vernacular languages as well. So there's a, there's a number of strands we, that we would like to see coming through uh, in the Mandela University Press as we transition from the old two series. Those two series are still ongoing, but, I thought, but we thought that, uh, that some of those series will interconnect with the Mandela University Press in different kinds of ways. So thanks for that. I'm so sorry for that, Viona, for having to bath in here. <laughs> You're very welcome, Professor Kiet. And we would actually, uh, from a decolonial sense, question the notion of conflict of interest. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can, can we now invite our DVC, um, Dr. Tanti? Thank you so much.
have to get my phone just in case the child is stranded again. <laughs> That's a uh, multitasking. Uh, colleagues, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And uh, congratulations on this very special <coughs> book launch uh, today. I truly appreciate the opportunity to provide closing remarks. And uh, while I wish to commend the authors for embarking on this writing journey, um, it's really, really appreciated that you, you address critical social work education and social work issues. It's not only social work that is being uh, spoken about here. I think it's just uh, life and way of doing as Africans and going to the heart of the Africa we want. And I'll come to that just now. And uh, Mrs. Squam, I can relate to the actual word problem. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a natural scientist, medical scientist by profession. So I always wondered, humanities and social sciences, where do you get these words that you produce a book? Because, I mean, as you know from our field, you produce journals, like a three-page journal is journal article that's the, that will get high impact because of those standards. And to get a book as a child, I always wondered, how on earth do you get so many words? So the word problem was quite relatable. Um, and also, I would just like to acknowledge and uh, be really grateful about the approach to a supportive writing experience that you've, uh, you've offered uh, to new writers. I think the investment in the process will uh, will be good in the end because now you're not going to go through this doubting process again. You're just going to run because of the investment in the initial process. Apiwa, I don't believe that you are doing this for the first time. I think you're just <laughs> telling us lies. <laughs> Your analysis uh, reminds me of what my dear sister, who's a social worker herself, um, I don't know if you've heard in, in uh, Facebook, that lady who calls herself keep moving that the way to we, we are from the same clan and uh, you just reminded me of the things that she raises of course in a in a comedy comedy fashion but she raises exactly the issues that you've mentioned here about the legal profession how the social work profession is undermined and uh, all the, all these issues it just but but in a in a fun and, uh, and, and an engaging uh, fashion. So I truly appreciate that. And uh, congratulations once again to all the authors. And the poet, Akan, you are absolutely out outstanding. I, I wish you could just continue and uh, have a session of yours and we, we listen. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just reflecting on this a beautiful gathering here. I mean, the world next, next week is gathering at the World Science Forum in Cape Town for the first time hosted in an African country. And I was just thinking things like this should be at that stage. I mean, this book launch and this kind of a seminar kind book launch would have been a perfect opportunity to uh, to speak about uh, the, the African ways and how we're changing the discourses. And so I'm challenging you, uh, the Professor Kidd, to take this further up on other stages where we can talk about and, and expose it even further. Um, because the World Science Forum theme is um, science for social justice. And science for social justice resonates with everything that we do at Mandela. And uh, this is, these are just perfect opportunities for us to engage the rest of the world. I guess you are going to ask me, Andre, now, which SDG is this? And uh, I'm not going to answer that question. But I can tell you that it is all of what is rooted in the Africa 2063 agenda. Uh, that agenda is called the Africa we want. This is the Africa we want. Uh, social work, by its very own definition, gives the mandate to itself of sustainability, of development, of goals, 
and uh, we did we need not explain it in in those frameworks and SDG frameworks. I think it says it uh, for itself. Of course, I appreciate the the Mandela Press. Uh, Mandela Press makes uh, scholarly research available on an open access base. Um, according to the well, it's not really really free because there's a gold open access route which we are still fighting these subscription costs uh, with uh, with the people that the powers that are. So I'm appreciative of that open access route so that we can make this knowledge accessible. And uh, of course, open access and open science have got the potential of making scientific process and, uh, and writing and open access uh, uh, accessible to all in a democratic manner. It is definitely not democratic at this stage, but I think that's what we are striving for. And uh, also the interdisciplinary nature and the truly transdisciplinarity of social work studies is evident because it is underpinned by social sciences, by humanities, by indigenous knowledge. So there's, there's a whole lot of uh, knowledge that we can gather from this book and make it applicable uh, to all the disciplines. And uh, I'm very proud of this. And I'm very proud particularly of what is mentioned as 18 critical minds uh, from Africa. I don't really like the 18 African minds. I think these are minds from Africa. And uh, sorry, that's a, that's a little uh, critical, I, think, I guess, <laughs> a, a definition of your scholarly uh, contribution. I have not read the book, but I, uh, I look forward to receiving a copy. Oh, sorry, purchasing a copy. <laughs> um, uh, once again, congratulations on this really very important book, book release and launch and uh, about this conversation. And thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. Mr. Hi, uh, can you hear me? <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. um, greetings uh, to the Vice Chancellor of Research, Innovation, and uh, Internationalization, uh, Dr. Tembim Kwebi. <laughs> By the way, um, Gumkaya, we come from the same uh, town, small town called Tawankul. It is indeed a privilege uh, to have you, uh, Doc. Um, greetings uh, to the um, to the deputy vice chancellor of um, engagement and transformation, uh, Prof. Andre Kitt. Um, evening uh, to the executive deans that are here: academics, uh, students, um, social workers. Um, yeah, everyone that is here. Good evening, colleagues. And also special greetings uh, to those uh, who are not here with us, um, who are connecting um, virtually. My role today um, is a very important, uh, a very significant uh, aspect of this event. That of a uh, vote of thanks. <laughs> yeah, um, it would be of a dishonorable man of me not to thank uh, Prof. Andrew Kitt and um, the late uh, Prof. Michael Cross, um, his soul uh, rest in peace, sorry, uh, for inviting the department to take, to take up this mammoth of a challenge to write the critical social work studies in South Africa, prospects and challenges, as part of the larger book uh, series of the high, higher education uh, transformation. Um, the book uh, would not have been possible without um, them entrusting us with their imagination. Um, words of appreciation 
um, to the editorial uh, team for driving the book project and ensuring its uh, realization. Um, colleagues, uh, we thank you for your hard work and also your resilience uh, during the most uh, testing times and difficult times of COVID-19. Um, a pandemic that um, exacerbated um, the socioeconomic issues of our country and a, a pandemic which further, in fact, exposed uh, the limitations and contradictions of our profession. Um, and of course, we thank the authors for their contribution and diligent work um, that made the process very effortless for reviewers and the administrative team as well. Um, thanks to the administrative team, uh, which is myself, <laughs> for making sure the coordination uh, and also um, a smooth uh, communication uh, between uh, the authors and other um, different uh, stakeholders of the book. Uh, to the Department of Social Development Professions at Nelson Mandela University, um, the leadership, uh, and also all colleagues, the staff as a whole, students, we thank you for your support. Um, we thank you very much, and also for housing um, the book. Um, our appreciation also goes further to the Faculty of Health Sciences Executive Management for their assistance during the development and the upbringing of the project and also um, Kandrat um, for assisting with the logistics um, of this event towards the end um, of the uh, book project. Um, and of course, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Nfloko. Um, for your input and also for introducing uh, this book uh, to the public. We thank you for that, for raising very pertinent uh, discussion that are therefore indispensable for, for the social work uh, profession and also for the social work practice and education. <laughs> Lastly, um, thanks to each and every one of you um, for making the launch a prosperity. Um, and all the best as well in terms of utilizing um, this book uh, in order to articulate the lived realities of many South Africans. Uh, this is such an important <coughs> local grounded uh, work with potential um, global implications. Um, yeah, I'm also referring um, to the interminable and also continuous discourses on decoloniality time as critical social work and moving towards a more con contextualized curriculum and epistemologies uh, of the global south. Thank you very much, colleagues. Have a great um, evening, um, Feather. OK, um, in order to sign uh, for the book, um, you are going to go outside at the registration uh, place. Okay, um, lastly, uh, I know there's food outside and uh, everyone is rushing to the food. I know, <laughs> I remember when we were uh, first years and second years, you know, myself. By the way, I'm writing my book with uh, Dr. Patron Zilin. Wow. Yes, so um, we, we used to think that uh, Kandrat was a, a catering uh, company. <laughs> <laughs> It was precisely because every time we went this Conrad, there was always food, so we always go. <laughs> so uh, those uh, were the years, um, and thank you, uh, Petro, for partnering with me for this uh, book. Um, lastly, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so we prepared something special for Ntloko. Now, Apiwe Achavu is asking, do we do it in public? Now, he wasn't aware of it. So this was no bribery. Ntloko, so we've just got a special thank you. We are aware that you're a PhD student. And Ntloko took unpaid leave to do his data generation. And I think it really speaks to the passion for 
for the work that he's doing. Um, and so we really just wanted to honor the time. You've taken time away from your studies to read the book back to front. And I think the way in which you engage with it is absolute testimony that you read every letter. So thank you very much. And Loka from our side, so just a small token of appreciation. And then to Philip, our restaurant, uh, on my left-hand side here. Thank you so much, Philip. You always just step up and the entire digital team. Thank you for the live streaming. Um, we're eternally grateful. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been an amazing audience, our online audience as well. And we really value the time that you've devoted to be here tonight and to celebrate and be happy with us for all the critical questions. We now invite you to join us outside for something to eat and drink. Our students, we've got the three copies, so we will be at the table. We will do the lucky draw. And then the signing of the book will also happen on the outside. Uh, so you can have your something to eat. And for those that want to purchase the book, we're quite happy as the editors to position ourselves at the table and to sign. Um, and then we'll do the lucky draw for our students. So if they can get your food and then make your way to the table, where we will do the lucky draw on that side. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Here's your gentleman table. All right. A cook or say, Goli, Gondongazia, to Magupaya, a ringing. You tend to call and go good to sing and Zulu, Gunthalo, your paya, a ringing. Swimming at Tisna Bapeka, Shimming Kubos, Zatawin, Sikalekan, your pa, Ekalin, Subulis on Ostend, Hallelujah, or Alpha and Omega, is Galones Pelos, Sukula Serengin, and that tail is Dizendab and Jogolisa Kanya, Pepes, Tesswai, Swalo Pelepele, Masanganis Nanjins and Taloyabo, Kamabanja, Paya Erringin, the Malay Sankin in Jangatala, Banchu Banchubeka, Machalan of Galelo, Ugandiba Sanjur and Samachel and Matiki Tawa, Abandona Babo, Bashilim Kalin, Goksolo Kobeno Totolos, Telos and Zazas Arams, Nukim. As Kobukile, Snyamazala Makwan in Vulas Gugile, to Kalalang was Susra Serengin. What a abuse of entanglement of relationship. Let's get deep into each character there, deep into the fuse that lead this dungeon pit, deep in the roots of this destructive tree, so we may see that a kuko se koli kwandonga ziatoma kupaya erengin, so we may see that kwanya my peli kupayak fuchane, bongas as top and abyss descends in the sun, causes na betong tishalakas bapele rengin, bongo no butlebeta shaletu, isn't just as the city's yabonis. Takwe to Zapele Rinkin, Tibon and Get Tashalka Kakeka, Disakaleni, Diaqua Pitalo put to make Nasang Bash Ben Kappa, a Yusuke Way Pitong at Yolan in the Behabati, the Condemn and Cowles and Yom Chonga Rinkin, Tandem La Gaza, the Perfum Long Gama from Banning Mongileo, Isan, Disaklin Chukumos Nins, the Shukanga Tashani, Yao Zivas Nes Dumas Nes Gima, Yao Beva Becambli San, Kuba Glashabani, Uzaiva, and Mibonga Batengis, Spamlis to Flavelo, Kenas Sin, the Quens in Tacona Nan, Zamuku Beg and Japan. Erinkin, Ukuzumba on Tumpa Vela Shashini, Isusakas Poko Tagil as Malas Rapilis, Akubanya Bakubus, Tutangas Kunda, Abonabona Fosak, Bapaya Erinkin, Bazuabas Kola Gamaya Zain Zais Manga, Oke where Mind Lenya Kosuka Bingo Kaulez of Tibetan of Nama, Tulunoyana, Pesquaka selling a side pendal baker and kin, the Chetangazas and Bazjan and Sanas Duke, and then Gweminyakas when his Thomas and Sanazas or Ina Eterinkin, but Tatas and Sanas Dingayo, Ezias Gens and Andoni, Ezas Sanok Shu. Mama was on a zangal party, Kamalkatata, that a long posum shanners along for the Kakes at Becum Payan Dini, a cook or sick goli, Gondongas yet to Magupaya Erinkin, Zezia's figures top is busy plating Magala, Zikalia figures him, gave a figure six to a set chill and a banya was the kicks and move to Mesum Legua, Zezas as Becca Quinana Balenga Blasta, Nanjangoko in Picano, Pacatico Saba Pecca, Yoyan Jule, Esses Binis Zemvas, yes, Pondu Kubaukuzo Gulunge, Magasuke, Umpekim, Charles Tatalabatingi, Umpefum Lutatalu. 
lula paya konga tiktati pondi pesko tafile umpefu mlutatwa lula paya ubenga tonturi jasa mba kotango akuko sekoli kwa ndonga ziatuma kupaya erengin benga fani kanjalo kia ukua komtu bapuma bonke bozi masa mngwaben bambi bele ukense kisu kufa ka bambi bambi kuchongwe kwa ndonga putu kangu kwa zingana bel pala pambi liliza na abo kwa kisela kuna kola ngubunga kana ni besu mwamu ben teta na mnyo abakubi ubiki mbilini ake kumesi tupana ngaba wenza imbaza wame nina motu enu wange vaka mkwele bizi nda wapela kuyo ufeli zono za banyi abakubi ya bangina imbe kona jila ya kuteta ute kumesi fube kwa zifumane bathali nge ngamse benza wenza eno kwa zikata anfuno toka siswa basilo no tegs gola bako wana bacho nga mtu wange njenge tuba lo kubiki si cha pam kwa banduana unobu tebeze rinkina nga fumane skolo Waizo kunisi malo palisa kunya kwa za. Kengayo kucha bake, nubukle bake, zoke za mganelwa. Ezi pata manda za bakubi, za kukupisa na loku mfake zikubien bonge ba pumelela. Ba mshia nesi nyampu sa malinga ikondi ya nubawu tenki sengo pila. Yipanga yake izala za mmali zengeni iso ni mmali za mpato. Ntle kwa mkalu nyaku buli ndiwe. Omdoa na wakobo huka. Ili izuri tala kude. Yepefu mlagati wenzo kukubela. Ya itaka na sasitengi nukuba unubukle. Onya tele indambo. Watake nkanzi, akuko sekoli, kwa ndonga ziatuma, kupaya erengi. Please come to my show. I'm selling tickets.